So this morning we will continue on in our series in 1 Timothy. Today I'm going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 12 through 15. These are from the King James Version. And I will start off with verse 11, just because it's always fun to read. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. As we start this week, the first time I will remind you is, is that we have to understand the audience who Paul is talking to culturally. We also need to understand that this letter is written directly to Timothy, and that has some bearing on how things are worded as well. Verse 12 starts with, but I, we covered this last week. This is not Paul saying, God says, it's Paul saying, this is how I am doing it. Now, John or Peter or others may be doing it another way. This is my policy, says Paul. I suffer not. Suffer not means right now, at this time, in your situation. Not the future, not forever, in your situation. In whose situation? In Timothy's situation. I suffer not woman. In the Greek, there is no A. It doesn't say a woman. It says, I suffer not woman. Let me also point out that the word used in the Greek as well here, woman, is singular. It doesn't mean anthropos, mankind or womankind, or women. I suffer not woman to teach. Now, we have all heard this verse quoted by people who say that this means we shouldn't have women preachers. First off, all through the letters, Paul makes a very clear distinction between teaching and preaching, and it doesn't say that women can't preach. It also doesn't say this is a command for God, from God. It also doesn't say this is forever. And furthermore, it does, by the words used, appear to be talking about womankind or women altogether, but we'll get back to that. What it says is to teach. That means to present lessons, to educate. The next line, nor to usurp authority over the man. The word here for authority is authoritime. It is where the word authority comes from and also the word author. So you can think of authority as the ability to write the story your own way. But it is this line that gives the rest of these verses clarity. To usurp authority from the man, and in this case there is no the, it is to usurp authority from man, and the word man is singular. Now this is the interesting part. If you're the lieutenant governor of Montana, and you go out and you decide that you are going to speak for the governor, which is in your authority, but the governor wants one thing and you want another and what you're telling everyone is the way that you want things done. But people think it's coming from the governor and you present it like it's coming from the governor. Then you are usurping his authority. Now, when the lieutenant governor, as so often happens in big states, when the lieutenant governor becomes the governor, he or she is not usurping authority when they say, this is what the governor says. They're not usurping authority because they are in authority. They are not taking something that doesn't belong to them that they don't deserve. They are receiving the authority that they have earned and deserve. A few years back in Oregon, I saw a young man named Christopher usurp some authority. 
He was about 10 years old, but he had grown up on a farm. He was a farm kid. And this young man, Christopher, usurped authority over the Department of Motor Vehicles. I stopped by his family farm one day, and I saw him driving the farm truck. And he drove much better than Devlin does now. But no matter how good he drives, if he went tooling down the road and got pulled over, they would say he wasn't ready to drive because he had not taken the tests, he was not the right age, he had not paid the fee, which is what the government really cares about. That's what really counts. He didn't get the DMV's authorization. He just jumped in the truck and took it. He usurped or passed over the authority of the Department of Motor Vehicles. But, but, 10 years from now, they will give him that authority. It has not been forbidden to him. That is not saying, this is not saying you can't hold authority over a man. It is saying be an authority first. Remember in chapter 1 when it says in verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. There is nothing wrong with desiring to be a teacher of the law. But first, you have to know what the law is. And because the verse we are talking about comes one verse after verse 11, which says, let the women learn for the first time in history. Paul is not saying that women can never be teachers or preachers. He is saying, let the women learn, hooray, and then they can be teachers and preachers. He doesn't suffer women to teach the law at this point because he just gave the command that they are even allowed to begin to study the law. And again, in the scripture, the word man is singular. So if we were to put this in modern terms, what exactly is Paul saying? I think it would sound something like Paul has a, pro a policy where he is currently not allowing woman to teach classes or hold authority she hasn't earned or established herself in over man, singular. Now, before we go further, this is why I want to point out the fact that woman and man are both singular in this verse as opposed to mankind or anthropos and all the plurals in the letter. Paul is writing to a pastor, Timothy, who he has trained and he is writing to him about things that are going on in his church. Now, we do not know for sure, but the reason these two words may very well be singular is that Paul is talking about a woman in the church who has just started to scratch the surface of the scriptures, and now she wants to teach, but she is not ready. And Paul says woman singular and man singular as a way of saying to Timothy, you know what people I mean. I won't mention them by name because I want you to read this letter out loud. Maybe Timothy had asked about this situation before and this was in answer. Maybe the church had this woman who was a new Christian but wanted to take the bull by the horns and was the loudest person in the room, something I know about, but she didn't have the knowledge to back her up. Either way, whether this is one woman, all women, one man or all men, the message is the same, be a student and then be a teacher. Be a thinker, not a stinker. This is for men and women Complete the studies necessary to be a teacher first. Again, let the women learn was one verse ago. If you got the, just got the right to start learning, you are not ready to teach. You do not let first graders teach high school. 
We also don't let kids in middle school teach grade school. This is not a call against women or the woman. It is a call from Paul to not allow people to teach that do not know what they are talking about. The rest of the verses back up what I'm saying about usurping authority. Verse 13, 4, which means because Adam was first, then Eve. Back in Genesis 2, Adam was given a command. Adam was given authority. Genesis 2, 16 through 18 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest eat, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Then God makes the animals, and Adam names them. Then verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. Adam was given the command. Eve was taught the command by Adam. If Eve comes first, and gets the command before Adam is made, who is in authority? Who is responsible for your children learning right from wrong? You are. Because you came first. You learned the rules of polite society and your faith first. Then you teach those things to your children. You pass them on. If you're trying to potty train a two-year-old and they say, I don't want to go there in the potty. I want to go in my pants. Do you start going in your pants to see if they're on to something? Of course not. Adam had knowledge from God about that tree. Knowledge that he was supposed to pass on to Eve, not the other way around. I have some disc golf knowledge. I love to play disc golf with people who think I will just play once a year and pick the game up. The reason I love to play with people of limited knowledge is I like to win. Adam allowed his authority, his knowledge to be usurped by someone that he was supposed to be teaching. Genesis 3, 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Verse 14 says, And Adam was not deceived. You see, Adam was not deceived. Oh no, he did it willingly. He knew better, even worse. He had a responsibility to his wife, and he failed her as well as God. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression, is what we just read. Let me point out how Eve was deceived. She either did not learn the command from Adam, like when you tell your kids something and they're not paying attention, and you say, what did I just tell you? And they rattle it off verbatim without paying attention still. Kids think that's cute and that they are smart. The problem is three years later when they need that advice verbatim, word for word, it's not there anymore because they didn't really learn it. They parroted you and then they forgot. Either Eve did not learn the command from Adam, or Adam didn't teach it to her correctly. This is neat. Look at the command that God gave Adam. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But when Eve is confronted with the serpent in chapter 3, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. Now I just read you what God said to Adam. Did God tell Adam not to touch the tree or you will die? Did God tell Adam not to touch the fruit of the tree or you will die? God told Adam, do not eat the fruit of the tree. Now either Adam gave these instructions to Eve and she parroted them off without listening to them, which means that when she was asked to recall what God said, she kind of stumbles into, uh, that tree's bad. We can't eat it or touch it. Or, and this is more likely, as a way to keep her from the tree, Adam did the thing that we do to our kids. He didn't really explain it. He just said, look, just don't ever go near that place over there without explanation, which means that she did not know exactly what it was she was supposed to learn from Adam about what God said. Either way, she is deceived by a lack of knowledge. If she expected to die when she touched that fruit and did not, it made it really easy for Satan to twist God's real words because she did not know what it was God had actually said in the first place. The point of all this is know what it is you're talking about. If you are teaching almost truths or the feel-good gospel where we don't hurt people's feelings, you are building handholds for Satan, and he will use them. Verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Notwithstanding is Paul's way of saying this is is the bottom line. This is what I am getting at. She is saved. The word translated saved here also means healed. It is the word used throughout the New Testament for both healing and saving, which is super awesome. She is healed in childbearing. Think about childbearing in this culture. It is number one, the most important thing a woman could do. We have story after story of women who could not have children, who were later blessed with them, and we see the joy that it brought to them. But also, number two, it was the most dangerous thing a woman could do. It was the leading cause of death for women of that time up until the 1900s that was still the case. What this scripture describes is what I talk about often is that foxhole mentality because there are no atheists in a foxhole. I have been with many, many, entirely too many people over the years as they passed away and the two things they always say are the same. Oh God, forgive me and tell my family I love them. For women of this time and even today, childbirth is both of these things at once. You are on the edge of death and filled with love for your family. This is Paul not writing and saying, suffer women, suffer. That's not what he's saying at all. This is Paul saying that at no point will any man experience the closeness to God that a woman does when she is between giving a new life and risking her own life. She is healed if they, they or the kids, are raised or taught in faith, charity, holiness, and sobriety. Which, if you think about it, is a call for women to teach after all. Teach your children and don't make the mistakes of teaching them your ways Learn God's ways and teach them what God says. One of the most frustrating things as a preacher is when somebody spends 10 years telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. 
or that their God wouldn't do it that way. And then their children grow up to hate God and the church. Because you know who catches the blame for that? God and the church. God gave us written instructions. He will not make you read them. That is my main point for this week and what I want you to take home and remember. We are instructed in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. This is from the New King James Version. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Amen. We are told to go and share our faith. That is the Great Commission, and it is for both men and women. First, we have to know what our faith is. First, we have to learn about Jesus, not just the basics. We need to drink deeply of God's Word, and then we need to share it. The reason we must study God's Word deeply in order to share it with others is written right here in the scripture that I just read. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nation. That command does not say go and get people saved and then leave them to figure it out on their own. It says go and make disciples. And the only way that you can help others become a true disciple of Christ is by first being one yourself, man or woman. If you want to be a teacher, first be a student. I'm going to end there for today. Again, I feel like I've just dodged another bullet. In all truth, I think these scriptures have been used for years to try and take away a woman's place in the church, and I think that is a shame. Christianity has its roots in slaves and widows sharing the gospel in hidden homes and hidden rooms and without them we would not have the fancy church buildings that we have today we should honor all the women who made sure the message of jesus spread like wildfire guys i thank you for listening to me this morning